Now, Gene, try to explain in layman's language what the problem is up there, perhaps by looking at this graphic. Related to turbulence in an airplane. Uh, you know, an airplane starts shaking around uh, when it gets in turbulent air at high speeds, and there's a certain point at uh, 30,000 feet when you combine the density of the air with the speed of the shuttle that you develop this turbulence no matter what. Now, if you add winds to that turbulence, you get forces on the spacecraft which are unacceptable uh, structural forces. And what happened, of course, up there at 30,000 feet this morning was that they had winds coming from one direction, which they had programmed into the computer, which they had anticipated, in a sense, in their flight model, and they got winds from the other direction, yeah. measuring the winds, measuring the velocity of the winds, returning that information down to Earth to mission control at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. It then goes through an inordinately complicated computer procedure, then that information gets transferred here and then decisions are made. There's a planned hold coming in the launch countdown in about two and a half minutes. And we will be back right after these messages as Discovery sits on the pad This ABC News coverage of America's return to space, the launch of the Space Shuttle Discovery, is brought to you by Siemens. Half hour Back at the Kennedy Space Center, let's go briefly to launch control. The uh, nine-minute hold is normally a uh, ten-minute one. However, we can hold at this point for a considerable length of time. Just want to reacquaint you here now. That's Launch Control here at the Kennedy Space Center. That's Hugh Harris, who is the voice of Launch Control. You'll hear him a lot as we get closer to the launch, and then basically he'll handle the launch for us. But it's been so long in many respects since we've been here for a launch in this form that perhaps it's useful to reacquaint ourselves and everybody else with what actually happens. That's Launch Control here at the Kennedy Space Center, and they have control of this mission until the shuttle clears that enormous launching pad, and then it's taken over by Houston. Hugh Harris was telling us just a minute ago that we're approximately 30 minutes behind, and that was caused by some of the minor delays this morning, which occurred on the ground. We still haven't heard all of the news yet about the weather, but that enormous external tank has been filled with its liquid hydrogen and its liquid oxygen. That is the red or brownish tank you see in the middle right behind the shuttle. They're T minus nine minutes and holding. The reason, by the way, that tank is not white, like the two outboard fuel tanks and the shuttle itself, is simply to save weight. I think it's about 600 pounds of paint it takes just to paint that thing, so they've left it off. And of course, it has got all of that fuel, which will take them all the way, hopefully, to their first orbit today. Now, we've been talking about machinery so far, and I suppose that's inevitable in terms of Challenger. It's been a long 32 months since the Challenger explosion. I said we've got the most experienced crew uh, that has ever gone into space. Let us have a look at them. Let's meet them with ABC's Lynn Sherr. The crew that will return America to space is the most experienced, best drilled group of astronauts that has ever flown. They are the first shuttle crew composed entirely of veteran space travelers and the first to be intimately involved in the redesign of the shuttle and the space agency. Three of them flew combat missions over Vietnam. All are married with children. The commander is Navy Captain Rick Houck, 47, who commanded NASA's daring rescue of two broken satellites in 1984. We train very, very hard here at NASA. Uh, we exercise every contingency we can think of, any failure that we can cope with. Um, combine that with my real belief that we're doing everything we can to make this probably the safest flight we've ever flown. I don't see that playing a major role in how I approach this flight. Um, I'm sure the heart rate will be up, but it's always up when you launch. Hauk calls his style of leadership benign dictatorship. And while he recognizes the risks of taking discovery into orbit and America back into space, he admits that his love of adventure made him a test pilot in the first place. I'm sure there's a, a sense of a little bit of danger. I'm not a risk taker, but there's something in that that, that is uh, fun. Pilot is U.S. Air Force Colonel Richard Covey a 42-year-old who describes himself as an expert at the orbiter's systems. I'm probably a very boring 
technical uh, pilot, you know, and I guess that's kind of how I look at myself. Of the three mission specialists, Dave Hilmers, 38, a lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps, will serve as flight engineer, sitting behind Hauk and Covey on the flight deck. I think that, you know, if I look at my innate talents, I'm, I'm probably a fairly mediocre type person, but I, I like to believe that with what God has given me, I've done the best that I possibly could. Mike Lounge, a 42-year-old former Navy flyer, will help launch the communication satellite Discovery is carrying, a task he performed on a previous shuttle mission. And astronaut Pinky Nelson, 38, the only crew member without military experience, will also launch the satellite and carry out some of the experiments on board. This job is absolutely perfect for me. I love being an astronomer, trying to, uh, you know, drag secrets out of Mother Nature is a, is a wonderful occupation. Together, these five men have seven shuttle flights among them and have been training for this mission on Discovery for more than 20 months. Uh, there's something else about this crew, too. They are, I think, perhaps the most serious crew that I've interviewed ever in all my years of covering the shuttle flights. You know, these fellows really do have the right stuff. They're all trained, they're all veterans, but they didn't sit up there in the stage and they haven't swaggered around the center here with that kind of cocky, oh gosh, we're not afraid of anything attitude. All of a sudden, everyone here at NASA is much more sobered as a result of the accident, uh, and these gentlemen really reflect it. Peter? Thanks very much, Lynn. We'll be back to you shortly because Lynn is out there quite some distance away from the pad today because the Air Force has decided it's going to restrict the number of people who are as close as we have the good fortune to be. And Lynn is out there with all of the VVIPs, we call them, the very, very important people. Now, here's one of the weather planes uh, that's been up and out today. And, of course, one of the other things that they've been doing now is checking the landing site here at the Cape itself because when Discovery takes off, and if those engines fail, it has a number of options for returning to Earth or getting into orbit. But one of its very first options is its commander, Rick Houck, turning it around, or trying to turn it around to get it back to land here at the Kennedy Space Center itself. And so that flight is out there this morning, just checking the winds on the runways here at the Cape. Lynn Sher was talking about experience. Uh, let's go to Houston now and meet more of our experience. Joining us now is ABC's Mort Dean. Uh, who has been uh, reporting and commenting on space for a long time. And Joe Allen, the Apollo astronaut. Joe, I think none of us will ever forget what you looked like, little fella that you were holding that enormous satellite in space. <laughs> Welcome, both of you. How's the mood in Houston this morning? Well, first of all, I think he's made us appear older than we yes, really yes. are, but thank you anyway. Only Peter. you, Mort. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the mood is pretty much uh, the same as it is uh, where you are. Uh, there's a mood of excitement. People are ready to celebrate. Uh, they're exhilarated, but they're also very, very nervous. Joe? Well, I would agree. It's uh, uh, a, a game of waiting here with us right now. We've, we've seen this before. We've been very successful with it before. I'm reminded uh, four years ago, I sat with Rick uh, in Discovery waiting for the winds to change. And I also must report that on the first day, they did not change, and we got back out of the machine. On the second day, and I, I think it's fair to say that the problem really isn't with the weather, but with the ability of the computers on board to deal with this kind of weather system. And, and Joe, they've been saying since the very first shuttle flight that these computers were outdated. Why haven't they changed them? Well, they're very rugged, and we're, uh, we, the space community, are hesitant to put in less rugged but smarter computers, if you will. It would be possible to do, and there is an update plan to refit the orbiter computers. We just don't have them yet. Joe uh, was saying earlier, Peter, that the computers on board this shuttle cannot handle as much information as a common laptop computer <laughs> for your home can nowadays. But they really? do it with great reliability. Peter? Thank you both for the moment. Yeah, and of course, there are four computers on board, five computers on board this time, and if the four of them disagree, the fifth can make a decision. So uh, I trust you will both reassure us that the computers have enough strength to make the right decisions. I, I think they I can think do so. the job. Yeah. They're all in a computer phase now. There's no uh, particular activity being done by the crew on board itself, is there, Gene? They are sitting there allowing the computers to do the checks? Well, I think they're catching up with a few of the items on yes. the checklist Dick has here. Dick, where are they on your checklist then at the moment? Well, we're a little bit behind, uh, about 30 minutes, because, of, as you mentioned, uh, the fuse change out and uh, the, the closeout crew is just closing the hatch and pressurizing the cabin currently. And to checking make sure it for we leaks. Don't any leaks and then depressurizing it. The crew has brought the computers over 
to what we call Ops 1, which is the initial start of the flight, uh, of the actual flight software or programming that we're going to use uh, if we lift off here in uh, uh, another few minutes or so. Okay, we are nine minutes and holding. In a hold, this is a pre-planned hold, nothing untoward at the moment, and we will be right back. ...of uh, discovery uh, as it's pointed upward, uh, of course, and as we saw a minute ago, the, uh, the two white uh, tubular-like things alongside that orange tank are the, uh, the SRBs, the solid rocket boosters, which fire for... That's the cap on the top of the big external tank. Perhaps we could get a wide shot here and look at the big external tank. Uh, which has been fueled overnight with liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. And there on the outboard side are those solid rocket boosters to which you referred, Gene. And of course, they have been very much redesigned because of Challenger. I mean, that, that's been the focus of the, of the design changes. Although, uh, uh, Peter, there's uh, two, I guess, well over 300 changes in the, in the orbiter system itself, the entire system. So it's almost a, a completely new vehicle, although it doesn't really appear to be. We will remember, of course, from Challenger that it was the leak from one of those solid rocket boosters, a tiny, tiny leak through what they call an O-ring, where the sections are fitted together that allowed flame, because those things are giant Roman candles, and once you start them, there's no turning them off, which allowed flame to escape from the solid rocket booster, and then it ignited the enormous external tank, and we all watched it during the 25th shuttle flight. Now, There'll okay, be a, a, let, it, let us, uh, we've just heard from launch control, in fact, let's join launch control for just a second. Uh, CMQC, next time, PR. What they're doing is checking their communications, but they have just told the crew on board, the five-man crew, Rick Houck, Dick Covey, Dave Hilmers, Mike Lounge, and Pinky Nelson, that there's going to be at least a half-hour delay for them, and this pre-planned hold at the nine-minute mark should have been over by now, and it is not. Dick Richards, you've sat in this condition. In fact, Joe Allen said the two of you sat there yourselves in a very similar sedition on, on board Discovery. What do you think they're thinking at the moment, or are they just working? Uh, they really don't have a lot uh, to do right now, and uh, it's the launch team that's doing all the work and doing an analysis of this uh, upper uh, upper altitude wind situation, so the crew is probably wondering. But they're trying to stay sharp. Uh, as you can see, the people here in the white room... Uh, uh, that's the hatch. That's the hatch. Uh, the outside, the same Stop. hatch. Zero uh, for liftoff of Discovery. Uh, it is approximately a half hour from now at the earliest. Uh, NASA launch director Bob Seek is going through a uh, another weather uh, report uh, from the Air Force weather people, uh, both uh, for the Kennedy Space Center and all of the other sites around the world, uh, including Edwards Air Force Base uh, in case of an abort once around, uh, the Space Harbor in uh, New Mexico, and of course uh, Ben Guerrier uh, and Marone uh, overseas. Uh, Commander Rick Hauk has completed the uh, uh, leak checks, the initial leak checks of the uh, the cabin, and also the uh, redundant uh, leak checks uh, are underway. The uh, basically. Uh, there is uh, uh, two, uh, two valves which are in series uh, in the cabin vent system. And the initial leak check verifies the integrity of the first valve, and the second uh, verifies the integrity of the second or redundant valve. At time, we are reading within Hugh Harris is just now bringing us up to date and makes the point that it's going to be about a half hour now before it happens. And we do have a window here today, and that window ends at 1.41 Eastern Time, and it will end because it's some of those alternate landing sites in other parts of the world which the Discovery could use if they were forced to abort, if one of the engines failed, for example, it will get dark. And there they are, Edwards Air Force Base in California. After once around, if they get into orbit, Kennedy Space Center, they could come back to and meet. It's the first choice. And then overseas at Moron in Spain, Ben Guerrier in Morocco, and on the west coast of Acre, Africa at Banjul and the Gambia there are alternate sites which are all prepared, and the weather's got to be right. For example, at Moron in Spain today, Farmers are burning their fields on the edge of the runway that Discovery might use in the case of an abort, and the smoke is blowing on to the runway. 
You never uh, ask a farmer not to proceed with his crops, even on such an important occasion as this. But what we're going to do now is go away for a bit because the period of hold we now know to be at least half an hour. So bring us up to date very quickly, Dick and Gina. What do you think is going to happen in the next half hour? Well, the activity for the next half hour is really to get this leak check done, get the hatch buttoned up, get everything out of the white room, get all those people back to the roadblock. From that point on, we're just waiting for the upper altitude winds to see where we stand. We haven't, we should have heard something about the weather by now, Gina. Well, we have, and our spies tell us it's getting a little bit better, so we're a little optimistic, at least I am. Uh, uh, but I, I, I sense a feeling of conservatism. There is some time here. They're taking 30 minutes. Maybe it'll be 40. I don't know. Uh, we've got until after 1 o'clock this afternoon. Make sure everything's right. Of course, those winds come in. We'll pick it up at 9. Once we pick it up at 9, we're either going to go or the abort, or if there's a scrub, it'll be a scrub for at least another day. Yeah, but the thing, as you begin to point out here, is that there is there is a new conservatism, and Lynn, and Lynn Sure pointed out there's a new sobriety here about safety. Yesterday in that final pre-launch news conference, every one of them made exactly the same point, that there's a, there's a whole new chain of command because this rocket has been redesigned, but NASA has been restructured and reorganized in many cases. And before the decision is made by Dick Crippen, John Crippen, up at the top, to go or not to go, there's a whole chain of command of people underneath who are watching every element of this flight. And they have gone out of their way to say, sure, there's pressure from the public, sure, there's pressure from the media, for America to get back into manned space, but what they want more than anything else on this mission is a safe mission. Keep it hasn't got system. many complicated things to do on this it, mission, do they? It's a test flight of the whole system. Uh, you know, th this whole country's got something at stake, and, and I think that's why the anxiety is a little different this time. Uh, I, quite admittedly, I feel it. I, this has to be a success. This country needs it. We have to get rid of the burden, the guilt we've been carrying about shuttle and get on with it, and I think that's what you feel, that's what you sense. I even see it in the news media, I think. I must confess, as a member of the news media, I feel it. I drove into Cocoa Beach last night, and the signs outside the motels and the grocery stores and everything else are exactly as they were back in the 1960s when we came down here to cover Gemini and Mercury. There is some of that same feeling as almost if people could urge the space program to get going again. Do you feel it in NASA, Dick, or is it, is it, is it very conservative, as Lynn suggests? Well, I feel the sense of uh, pride that we're actually going to get back in the flight business. Uh, two and a half years is a long time for, uh, for some uh, very motivated people to be sitting on the ground. But uh, I echo your earlier comments, the fact that uh, we're not going to uh, launch this thing until we're ready and we're sure that it's safe. This upper altitude wind situation is very serious, and uh, we're not going to compromise any factors of safety. Okay. Well, we will be back. We will be back, both of you. Thank you very much. We'll be back. The latest, it's considered they can launch. The latest would be shortly before 2 p.m. Eastern Time. The astronauts are ready. The shuttle is ready. NASA is ready. They're just waiting, still waiting, for word that the wind speeds have picked up enough and the wind direction has shifted enough in line with what the Discovery computers have been programmed to handle. The Discovery crew members have been told to hang in there. They and we will be doing just that. We're here waiting to let you know if and when the countdown resumes and the winds are right. 11.20 Eastern Time, now the, e the earliest time that they will launch.